Hello, and welcome to the Pirate History Podcast. My name is Matt. Thank you for listening. In March 1569, at the French port of La Rochelle, a group of 18 sea captains met and conferred. Some of these men had spent their entire lives as outlaws, raiding shipping in the North Sea and the English Channel. Others were more recently brought into the trade. They were men who had been pushed from their lives, and as talented mariners, people who decided to take up piracy. They were talking about a new development in their lives. Each of these 18 men was in possession of what was called a letter of reprisal, better known as a letter of mark. They had just received it from Louis of Nassau, the brother of William the Silent. For these men who had always been outlaws, on the run, on the high seas, from the authorities, be they Spanish, French, or from the Low Countries, they now had a measure of legitimacy, and they had to decide exactly what they wanted to do with that. To many in Europe, they were still outlaws. They would have to run from the Spanish just as they always had, and from most of the Dutch authorities. However, in the ports that were friendly to them, be they the port they were currently in at La Rochelle in France, a Huguenot port, or any of the ports in England, or even some of the ports in their homeland in the Low Countries, they would be able to stay there without having to sneak in and pretend they were somebody else. They could sail in proudly, and instead of pirates, they would be seen as freedom fighters. Some of these captains saw this as an opportunity to better themselves, make themselves a proper navy in the service of their country. Others, and some of the most powerful among them, saw this as license to plunder, sack ships, and raid. This is episode number 12, The Rising Tide. These 18 captains were the most prominent in the group known as the Sea Beggars, those pirates turned patriots that were now fighting for the cause of Low Country independence. They cast a net out across the coast of the Netherlands and into the North Sea. Any Catholic ship, be it French or Spanish, that was foolish enough to make their way into their path, well, they took that ship. Any worthy ship that they took, they sailed into a friendly port and had it outfitted for war. There was no shortage of young men eager to serve on these pirate ships, not just for the plunder, which they would be getting plenty of, but also for the chance to serve their newly founded country. Three of these captains at this conference stood out as leaders of the sea beggars. There was Lord Dalhine, the man who was giving most of the orders in the group. There was another named Jan Abels and another named Jan von Troyne. These three men, more than any others, realized that these letters of Mark gave them not just legitimacy, but responsibility. And not just increased risk, but also the chance for increased plunder. At nearly the same time that William and Louis of Nassau were granting these letters of mark to their pirate captains, Queen Elizabeth of England was issuing a decree against them. Any Englishman, any English port, or any English merchant that either gave harbor to or assisted these sea beggars would face severe consequences. At least that's what her decree said on paper. In reality, things were somewhat different. When one of those sea captains, Jan Abels, took five ships off the coast of Holland, the local authorities there in Holland sent three ships out to capture him. Now, Jan Abels had ten or maybe eleven ships in his command, so he easily could have taken these Dutch vessels, but for two reasons he decided not to. First, these weren't Spanish ships. Though they had been ordered by the Spanish to capture him, they were Dutch vessels, and he didn't intend to fight them. And second, despite the fact that he would have won that fight, he was a pirate, a man whose object was plunder, not battle, so he decided to flee to England. He had a particular hiding place in mind, but unfortunately one of those channel storms blew in and forced him to seek harbor in an English port. Naturally, an English harbor official came out to inspect his vessel, a vessel stolen from the Spanish, filled with Spanish loot, and manned by heavily armed Dutchmen. Jan Abels, though, wasn't worried in the least, despite Elizabeth's proclamation. He produced his letter of mark from Louis de Nassau and presented it to the inspector, and he assured the man that they had not harassed any English vessels. The harbormaster inspected the letter of mark and the Spanish cargo and agreed that everything seemed to be on the up and up. Jan Abels asked the harbormaster where might be the best place to sell his entirely legally obtained cargo. The Spanish ambassador in England, well, he would have been outraged at any other point in his life had this happened. 
However, he had other things occupying his mind at the time. Only recently, Queen Elizabeth had acquired all of the gold intended to pay the Spanish troops in the Netherlands. She had locked it away in the Tower of London, never to see the light of day. His king, King Philip II, was understandably outraged by this, and there was a constant line of communication going between these two men, and it was very clear that the Spanish ambassador was in deep trouble. Beyond that, ever since the Spanish had seized the English ships in the Low Countries that were Protestant vessels not adhering to Catholic law, the Spanish ambassador had been placed under house arrest in England, only ever allowed to leave his home to visit court and see the Queen, and even then only under heavy guard. It was on one of these occasions while visiting the English court that he saw the Queen meeting an emissary from a notorious source. He was the ambassador from William the Silent, the de facto prince of the undeclared Netherlands Republic. That emissary was Lord Dalhine, that man who was essentially the admiral of all the sea beggars. He was the admiral even of that Jan Abels, who was busy in that English port, selling his ill-gotten goods, buying rounds of drink for his men, and presumably enjoying some of the local English women's company. Lord Dalhine was in England attempting to build an alliance between his men, the Sea Beggars, and William of Nassau, and Queen Elizabeth. He had also been to La Rochelle meeting with Huguenot leaders attempting to build an alliance there. These three groups were essentially creating a league of Protestants in Europe, a league that was struggling against the combined papal forces of Spain and France and the Holy Roman Empire. This was in response to many of these papal forces moves against the Protestants in Europe. For example, the Duke of Alba and King Philip had elected to blockade all of the English shipping in their English home ports. Notably, there was a wine fleet that was stuck in London. It was bound for La Rochelle in France, but not allowed to leave the harbor, and more importantly, there was a wool fleet unable to leave English shores. They were intended to sail to Germany, where they would sell a large percentage of England's wool. So much, in fact, that this really threatened English livelihood. It was even feared at court that if this fleet weren't allowed to sail, this might collapse England's entire economy. To break the blockade, Elizabeth sent out her most trusted sailors. She sent out the Hawkins brothers, John and William Hawkins, from that troublesome voyage. She sent out the Winter brothers. She also sent out Francis Drake and all of his brothers as captains of different vessels to harass any Spanish ships that were blockading their trade and occasionally engage in what was really almost outright naval warfare. This was really one of England's first naval actions as a nation. After chasing off the Spanish blockade, she aided the Huguenot forces in the Channel and kept open the port of La Rochelle, both for the French and for the English to trade there. The Channel was becoming a place that was deadly for any Catholic ships. So many French corsairs, these Huguenot forces, were tied down in the Caribbean that really they had been unable to keep the Channel free. However, with this new alliance with England, they were really able to bolster their numbers and keep both the royal French forces and the Spanish from interceding in their trade. Now, on the east coast of England and in the North Sea, as well as along the coast of the Netherlands, it was really the sea beggars that ruled the waves. During this time, after the break of the blockade, hundreds of French and Spanish ships were taken, many of them stolen and still more burned. The navy of the Huguenots had for a long time, really, been a well-organized force. The Huguenot Rebellion had a well-established naval arm. However, now that the Sea Beggars and the English Navy were both in the fray, they really were able to press their advantage in their seas. This was the first time that England had really been able to put that massive navy they had been building to use. And the Dutch were organizing as well. Beyond the group of ragtag pirates they had been, they were becoming something more. Their fleets had grown too large, and their numbers swelled too much to rely on backroom meetings at the Beggar's Inn. They decided to elect, officially, Lord Dalhine as their admiral. Then, on August 15th, 1569, they signed an accord. It read, quote, 
Whereas, during the past years, the greater part of the nobility of Friesland, as well as Holland and this country, have been driven away from their fatherland, leaving behind goods, wives, and children to assist one another with all their possessions, bodies, and lives, only for the purpose of damaging, destroying, and annihilating the Duke of Alba and his bloodthirsty adherents. None of us shall, on his own account, either conceive and plan or begin any attack without the knowledge of all and without the consent of our common council and assembly. End quote. They were still not quite a navy. They were still pirates and their object was still plunder, but they did agree in that decree to give half of all of their proceeds to William of Orange in the cause of Netherlands independence. The combined forces of the Protestant forces at sea proved to be too much, at least in the North Sea, for the Catholic navies. So they turned to a higher power. They turned to Pope Pius V. He published a papal bull on February 25th, 1570. It was called the Regnans in Excelsis, and it read, quote, we declare the said Elizabeth heretic, and patroness of heretics, and her adherents to have fallen under the sentence of anathema, and to be cut off from the unity of the body of Christ, and her, Elizabeth, to be deprived of her pretended right to the realm, and of all and every dominion, dignity, and privilege, and also the nobles, subjects, and peoples of the said realm, and all else who in any manner have made oath to her to be for ever absolved from such oath, and all duty of liege, fealty, and obedience, as by the authority of the presence, we absolve them, and deprive the said Elizabeth of her pretended right to the realm and of all else aforesaid. End quote. I've mentioned this papal bull before. It was this action that so enraged not only the Queen and her Privy Council, but Sir Francis Drake. He, after this occurrence, finally convinced Elizabeth to allow him to go on what would wind up being known as Drake's War. If you are new to the show, or this is your first episode, I'd really suggest going back sometime and listening to episode number 8 at the Treasure House of the World. We go into some depth there, but in short, what Francis Drake did was take... A subsequent number of voyages to the Caribbean, where he attacked and plundered all along the many Spanish-held Caribbean islands and the Spanish main in more and more audacious fashion as the voyages continued, culminating in what was one of the most notorious acts of piracy ever undertaken in the entirety of the New World. It was there that Francis Drake met up and allied with many French Huguenot pirates and really opened up a an American front in what was becoming a global war between these two religious factions. Back in Europe, there was a fleet of sea beggars that left the English shores where they had been harbored to go and find a new homeland. They needed a port that was not La Rochelle, a Huguenot port, and not one of the many Protestant English ports, but a true Netherlands port, something that they could call their home base and center all of their actions around. Now, many of the ports in the Netherlands were somewhat friendly to the sea beggars, especially in the north. The locals there were not people that hated the sea beggars. The sea beggars never harassed the locals, only the Spanish. To show, though, the lack of ill will that the locals held toward the sea beggars, I'd like to read a bit from a letter to prove this point. The author of the letter wrote from his homeland near Amsterdam to some exiles in England. He wrote that, quote, Out of heartfelt pity have been moved to write you for the purpose of highly recommending to you an honest skipper of Amsterdam named Dyrick Allertzoon alias Black Dyrick, who, having arrived here at Imden from England, has informed us of his great misfortune and misery, that his ship has there, to his great loss, been seized, and to the great affliction and sorrow of his dear wife and children, of whom he is a large number. Whereas we have had such information concerning the said Derrick from the mouth of the witnesses, and from other honest merchants of Amsterdam, who have taken refuge there, therefore, upon kind request, we have not deemed it inadvisable to inform the brethren of the same, hoping that it will assist not a little in relieving his sad case. End quote. This man, Black Dyrick, he was just a poor merchant man from Amsterdam who was sailing from English shores and had his vessel seized. At least that's how this letter painted it. I imagine that the Spanish in the region didn't see him in the same light. To them, he was nothing more than a loathsome pirate, and despite these friendly locals, the Spanish really controlled all of the coastline of the Netherlands. So that fleet of 
Dutch vessels that was sailing from England, led by Lord Dalhine, to find a port that they could seize from the Spanish and hold against them, with the aid of both their Huguenot and English allies, much like the port at La Rochelle and several of the ports on the English coast were. However, as they approached the Netherland coast, a, a storm arose, and it forced the Dutch fleet into a, a Zeeland harbor. The harbor was called Vile. Now, while they waited for the storm to die down, another fleet sought shelter there. A total of 60 ships sailed into their harbor. These ships, as it turned out, were from the Baltic and bound for Spain. These ships were fair game for the pirates. The Dutch couldn't let a prize such as this slip through their fingers. So they spent the next two or three days plundering these 60 vessels of everything they had on board. However, after those three days, another fleet sailed into the harbor, chased by the very same storm, 40 ships that were even more richly loaded. These were some of the greatest prizes that the Dutch would ever take. I think about how something like that must have looked. In a relatively small port on the Dutch coast, battered by storm winds and ceaseless rain, 100 ships from around the North Sea were stuck there, unable to move. They had nowhere to run. Where could they go? Back out into the ocean? Into that ship killer of a storm? No, they were forced to stay at anchor and attempt to defend themselves against this roving band of pirates that was going from ship to ship, taking anything on board any of these vessels that they cared to. And beyond that, these pirates took not only the ships that they had taken a fancy to, but the crews of all of these vessels. They intended to hold them for ransom. Word spread quickly of the depredations of these pirates. It spread inland to the Spanish officials in the region, who marched a column of soldiers directly to the shoreline, who halted there and made a base camp, letting the Dutch know that if they were to disembark, they would be immediately attacked. This was intended to deter these Dutchmen from raiding inland, taking parties ashore, and raiding some of the smaller villages in the area. This was something that the Spanish were always somewhat fearful of. If the Dutch were to attack, it would prove to the locals in the region that the Spanish couldn't protect them and weaken their rule, so they took sharp measures to keep it from happening. Now, the Dutch knew that they had to leave, but they weren't deterred from their search for a home. Some of the ships in this fleet sailed to England or to La Rochelle to sell some of their plunder, but still more ships from around the area joined their fleet, swelling their ranks to even larger than before. The fleet traveled to an island, uh, an island called Aimland, that they had long used as a base where they unloaded much of their cargo. There was a lord in the area, a man named Peter van Kenminga, who was sympathetic to their cause. He allowed them to use his island as essentially a storehouse for any of their goods, but the sea beggars learned that Lord Peter had, well, he had been pressured into betraying the sea beggars by the Spanish. Before he could strike, the sea beggars acted first. They stormed his castle and took it relatively quickly. When they controlled the castle, they essentially controlled all of the island, and this was a strategic location for an island. It controlled a large amount of harbor and ocean around them, so this was a great place for the sea beggars to have as a home base. For several months, this island served as a base of operations for the Dutch. They launched countless raids from the island, and all over the North Sea, people knew that this was a place of terror to come near. Now, of course, the Spanish couldn't have that, so they give a man named Robles the task of liberating this island from the sea beggars. I'm going to read a passage from The Sea Beggars by Dingman Versteeg. This book was written in 1901, and though some of the history is somewhat questionable, it's one of the best sources we have on some of these men, and the language that Victorian-era history is just fantastic. Quote, Robles' first plan was to dislodge the beggars from their strongholds. For this purpose, he dispatched, in December 1569, a force of Spanish soldiers to the island of Aimland. Here, however, the Spaniards were so warmly received by the sea beggars, under their impetuous commander, the famous Grongire nobleman, Barthold Anton von Mentheda, that the attacking party was obliged to beat a precipitate retreat. Anton and his sea beggars remained for a month longer in undisputed possession of Kenminga's stronghold and the island of Aimland, whence they continued plundering the Groniger and Frisian coasts whenever the opportunity was favorable. 
This was not to be borne much longer, and Robles was resolved to drive them away at any cost. In January 1570, he sent out a much stronger expedition than the one of the previous December, and this time he was more successful. Under his own leadership, his troops surprised and attacked the sea beggars on Ameland. A short, decisive battle ensued in which the beggars were completely routed. End quote. Once again, without a home base, the beggars tried to find somewhere new that they could take. For months and months, they tried one harbor after another. One of their more famous captains, a man named Jan van Troyen, well, he took a market town that was directly between Antwerp and Amsterdam. This was a fairly important port of call. The Spanish were quick to send a battalion to oust him, though. The Spanish, well, they had garrisoned troops and many cannon in every harbor of the Netherlands. They intended to repel the sea beggars anywhere that they called. Still, they were becoming a real threat to the Spanish rule in the Netherlands. So, the Duke of Alba established a fleet. It was originally composed of 12 large Spanish warships, with the express purpose of destroying the sea beggars. This was a fleet, the likes that the North Sea hadn't seen for some time. The beggars, well, they fled as fast as possible. They were tracked by the fleet, however, and while running from this overwhelming firepower, they decided to try and take refuge in the harbor of a local inlet, a local river. They didn't expect these large Spanish vessels to follow them. However, some of the vessels were able to. The fleet chased them upriver, and finally, they soundly defeated the sea beggars. They took two of the sea beggars' largest ships and sinking two others. This was, of course, hardly all the ships that the sea beggars had in their armada. There were many remaining vessels in and around England at the port of La Rochelle and sailing elsewhere in the North Sea. A call went out to any of the sea beggar ships that could be found to rendezvous on the shores of England. They were received there by the Countess de Montgomery, who presented the Dutch with really a splendid ship, something that could be a flagship for them to replace one of their lost vessels. They named this in her honor the Countess. Despite this warm welcome by the English nobility, and despite the many friends and allies that the sea beggars had on British soil, England was no home to the sea beggars. The edict that Elizabeth had made against them still stood. Frequently, when they would chase in Spanish ships into English ports, they would be fired at and occasionally arrested. Now, these weren't acts of true violence, but they were made to ensure that the sea beggars didn't use England as their real home base. This was due in large part to the actions of the beggars themselves. They were a rough, violent, and uncouth lot who caused trouble wherever they went. Even those of them that were members of the nobility knew that they had to play a role and become a pirate. It had to be a part of who they were. They had to strike fear into their enemies' hearts. And to do this, they had to upset many of their allies as well. Even other friendly ports, like the port at La Rochelle, began to refuse some sea beggars' entrance into their harbor because of their propensity for causing trouble. So the sea beggars continued their search for a port of call. They needed a place that they could call home, a real base of operations. For months and months they searched, trying again and again to take different ports, and again and again they were defeated by the Spanish and their Dutch enemies. In one such encounter, that man Jan van Troyn, that favorite among the sea beggar captains, one of the most popular among their ranks, well, he was boarded before he was even able to mount an attack. The Spanish attacked him at sea. His men fought hard to defend their vessel. However, they were overwhelmed very quickly. All the men that were left had to jump overboard to escape Spanish capture. Now, there were other ships in this fleet that were still fighting the Spanish. But the men who had jumped off of Jan von Schoen's ship, well, they swam to the nearest vessel they could get to. They climbed aboard, and unfortunately, they found a company of Spanish troops had already taken her. Before they even climbed over the rail they found themselves staring down Spanish steel and Spanish muskets. This began happening with alarming frequency. The sea beggars were under attack by the Dutch and Spanish authorities. That fleet that had been organized to fight them was doing pretty well. So Lord Dalhine sent most of the sea beggar fleet to England, but he himself stayed with only 12 ships left on the Dutch coast. The sea beggars' ranks had moved to the safer harbors of English soil, while only a few of them, some of the most notorious among them, stayed to fight the good fight. This proves to have been something of a tactical mistake, however. While he may have saved the majority of the fleet of sea beggars, those twelve ships became the prime target for all of the Dutch in the region. That fleet, backed by the Spanish, caught up with those twelve ships in short order. 
His two largest ships were captured by the Spanish, taken. They were the best vessels they had, with nearly all of the arms and ammunition that they had in the fleet. Nine of the other ships were burned by the Spanish, and only one, carrying Lord Dalhine himself, managed to escape. Now, he went to England to join the rest of the sea beggars, but at the request of Prince William the Silent, when Lord Dalhine arrived in England, well, he was promptly arrested by the English government. This was due to a number of factors. There was money involved, as there typically is. Lord Dalhine had taken out loans that he had refused to repay. Other people had taken out loans that were his as well. And several other things that aren't exactly exciting. The reality is, if he had been doing better as the Admiral of the Sea Beggars, he likely would not have been arrested. William the Silent promoted another man to the rank of Admiral, a nobleman who was one of his friends, in the hopes that he would do a better job. However, this man wasn't the most experienced at sea, and if anything, the experience of the sea beggar fleet got worse. The core element of the sea beggars continued trying to take a home port and continued being rebuffed. However, many of the other sea beggar ships, those that had rounded out their numbers, well, discipline began to break down among their ranks. The captains weren't able to keep them in line, and in many cases the captains themselves decided to go rogue. They began going back to their old habits of attacking any shipping they could find and putting all the money into their own coffers rather than paying that half allotted to Prince William the Silent. Not only the Spanish and the Royal French, but also Dutch, English, and Huguenot vessels were now under threat from these rogue sea beggars. They were giving the beggars who were trying to be a Royal Navy a truly bad name and turning this from a fight for a good cause into real piracy. They were losing many of their allies and many of their friends during this period, and it was happening alarmingly quickly. So Prince William fired that second admiral as soon as possible. He promoted a third man, the most famous of all of the admirals of the Sea Beggars. He was the Baron of Lumi and the Count of Lamarck, known to history as William Vandermark. William Vandermark was... Well, he was one of the first and most ardent supporters of Dutch independence and William the Silent. However, initially, his fight was on land. He was a man who acted as a general in some of these armies, not a sea captain, but being from the Netherlands, he did have sea experience and, reportedly, quite a bit of experience with uh, piracy in general. He contacted any of these rebel, rogue sea beggars. Any of them that were still willing to fight for the cause under his leadership were allowed to come back into the fold. Any who had decided that regular piracy was more to their liking, they were essentially exiled from the Netherlands community. Now, he rallied all of the ships that were still loyal to the cause of Dutch independence and moved operations to England. The Netherlands had become an extremely dangerous place because of that Spanish-backed fleet that was patrolling her shores and had caused the sea beggars so much trouble. So, under William Vandermark, they operated out of the safe harbors of England, primarily in the Channel, around Dover was their real base of operations. A second contingent of the Sea Beggars, who was doing perhaps even better than the main contingent, operated off of the Isle of Wight. Now, their attempts to take a home base, to attack a port on land and take it and hold it, had all ended in failure, and the sea beggars were essentially broke, as was Prince William the Silent. They needed to raise some funds as quickly as possible. So, rather than attempting naval warfare or on-land warfare, the sea beggars turned back to outright piracy. They were taking only Spanish and French ships, only the Catholic ships that were their enemies, but they would take them, steal everything they had, ransom the sailors, and sometimes sell the vessels themselves. They became a real danger and a real menace. While that edict of Elizabeth's against the sea beggars still stood, the sea beggars were smart about this. Making so much money through piracy, they bribed any harbor masters on English soil that they needed to, as well as any government officials that came looking. They sent some of their money back to William, as they had before, but most of it went to go to the sea beggars, not so they could while it away on drink and women, which I'm certain they did, but much of it went to create a new, bigger, and better sea beggar fleet. Under William Vandermark, the sea beggar fleet was reborn. Discipline was brought back to their ranks, despite the fact that they were acting as pirates, they were acting in unison, and attacking every French and Spanish ship they could get their hands on. The channel for the French and Spanish was now more dangerous than ever. It was split between England and La Rochelle. There was a region that it was just immensely dangerous to travel through, and to get any shipping through, they had to send it through with a large fleet to guard it. All of these acts of piracy, done by the sea beggars, originated from English ports, which, in reality, suited Queen Elizabeth just fine. At first... <laughs> 
But then, on the 10th of February, 1572, everything changed. Without warning, one of the more notorious of the Seabagger captains was arrested by English officials. That very same day, William Vandermark received an order from the English government instructing him to quit English waters with every vessel under his command. Several other captains were arrested in the following days. They were subsequently released, but Elizabeth went so far as to declare William of Silent a false prince, and that made his letters of Mark null and void. John Hawkins himself was sent to chase this sea beggar fleet out of English waters. This ended what was one of the more profitable periods in the history of the sea beggars, and it was a serious blow to the Dutch, but it wasn't exactly the betrayal that it seemed to be. You see, around this time, Elizabeth really needed to garner some Spanish goodwill. She needed, just for a while, to have some of their favor. This was due to some of the politics involving the Catholic Church and the Scottish. There were developments in the Catholic Powers War on Queen Elizabeth that required her to play it safe for a while. However, Elizabeth ordered that no violence be used except by direct command of either herself or the Privy Council against the sea beggars. They weren't to be attacked, just to be chased off. This had to appear as legitimate as possible. Now, she neglected to enforce any of her decrees against the sea beggars through either her harbor masters or her merchants. This was all political theater, and it was well timed, too. The sea beggars had a plan. So well timed, in fact, that. It's almost suspicious. It makes you wonder if Elizabeth had messages from some of the sea beggars that now they had big plans and she was able to garner that goodwill with the Catholics that she needed. This plan that the sea beggars had was very bold, and it would require them to quit the English waters, so one way or another, it seems that everything was working out for them. The Duke of Alba in the Netherlands, well, he was in trouble. His taxes, this tax that he had enacted on the Low Countries, well, they were not being paid. Due to the lack of tax income, he was unable to enforce his rule, and many towns in the Low Countries stood in open rebellion against his rule. The sea beggars had returned in large numbers to the Netherlands, being unstoppable due to that Spanish fleet not being paid. Despite his early successes, for the Iron Duke, the Duke of Alba, the Netherlands proved to be too much for him as well. His successor, the Duke of Medina, was set to arrive in the Netherlands shortly. Now, William Vandermark did not intend to allow him to make landfall in the Low Countries. His fleet, the fleet of the Sea Beggars, which at this point was comprised of almost 40 ships, well, each one of them flew the colors of William of Orange, their prince, and each of them carried an additional red pennant that had ten pennies upon it, which was a declaration of their intent to deliver their homeland from Alba's hated tax, which was known as the Tenth Penny Tax. They sailed to the Low Countries in battle formations, toward the city of Brill. This was the rumored landing of the new duke. Now, when they were close to arriving, the town watch recognized them, and a cry arose, quote, The sea beggars have come, end quote. And the town was reportedly filled with panic. However, a local fishmonger who was sympathetic to the sea beggars was in the harbor, and he made his way over to their fleet. He met with William Vandermark and discussed terms with them. He returned to town after discussing these terms, and met with the city council there. He told them, quote, You need have no fear. The sea beggars will harm no one, and have come only to save the city for the king from Alba's tyranny and his ruinous tenth penny tax. End quote. He showed the town fathers a token that William Vandermark had given him to prove his legitimacy, and told them that the town had two hours to decide on what to do. The town fathers were in a quandary, though. They knew that if they were to surrender, the Spanish would send an army out to crush their town, doing great damage, perhaps killing women and children. That if they did surrender, he would bathe their town in blood. However, this threat standing right in front of him, the sea beggars, well, he knew that if he didn't surrender to them, they would sack the town immediately. While they were waiting for an answer, an army of sea beggars began to march towards town, and it appears that these men were beggars in truth. There are many reports of how haggard they looked. Their clothes were in tatters, nearly rags. All of them looked gaunt and hungry. The word want is used in the old text. They were starving. These men were desperate to find somewhere that they could be safe, find something to eat, and use as a new home. The town council told that fishmonger that they acquiesced to the beggars, and then they began to evacuate their entire town by a gate on the far side of the city. 
Now, the beggar captain didn't receive word of the town's surrender, so he ordered his ships to fire on the gate. He ignited casks of gunpowder on the gate, and he dropped down a mast from one of his ships and began to use it as a battering ram. Around 8 o'clock, on the evening of April 1st, 1572, the sea beggars took the town of Denbril and their first toehold in the Netherlands. They didn't sack the city, though, as most would have expected them to do. They took up residence in the homes of some of the town's richest who had evacuated. These were mostly Catholic merchants and leaders that were loyal to the Spanish and their Dutch subordinates. Now, while they didn't sack the towns, they did ransack those homes. They used any of the goods that they found and any money to buy themselves food and drink. They feasted after a good night's sleep. They were described as the very best kind of conquerors. In fact, they were found to be gentlemanly and quite a lot of fun. Now, it wasn't entirely without violence. The sea beggars did take prisoners. They took 19 priests in Denbril, and, well, they wrote to William the Silent. Now, William wrote back that no man was to suffer for his religion. The beggars were reported to have said, quote, Who captured Denbril, he or we, end quote and all 19 priests were hanged. A listener pointed out to me on the website, piratehistorypodcast.com, that there's a saying in the Netherlands, on April 1st, Alba lost his glasses. This is something of a pun, because the Dutch word for glasses is bril, B-R-I-L, while the town of Den Bril is spelled somewhat differently depending on when you're reading about it, but they sound very similar. Now, this listener told me that this is typically used as a way to teach something of the language to students, but it's also a little history lesson, which is similar to many of our rhymes and funny little childhood sayings. Things were going well for the Protestant cause all across Europe. The taking of Denbrel was it was a turning point in the Dutch Revolt. The Duke of Alba was finally leaving. The sea beggars were finally victorious and home on their native soil. The brothers, William the Silent and Louis de Nassau, were finally having some success on land as well. William Vandermark was made the stadtholder of Zealand and Holland. It was a position that he quickly turned over to William the Silent when he arrived. In the north of the Low Countries, they had really began to establish the Dutch Republic. Cities all across that north area were, well, they were in open rebellion against the Spanish. Finally, they had a cause that everyone could get behind. William had even gone so far as to garner the support of the Ottoman Empire under their ruler, Suleiman the Magnificent, who he claimed that he felt a, a kinship for the Protestant cause. He said that they both rejected idolatry and the Pope's rule, as well as their perceived polytheistic belief in the Trinity. I imagine the fact that both of these men, William the Silent and Suleiman the Magnificent, were fighting the Spanish, had something to do with it as well. Now, in this republic, things were going well. There was a mass migration of many of the wealthiest and best-educated men in the Low Countries to this newly founded Dutch Republic. They were people who, even if they were Catholic, were tired of the rules and high taxes of the Spanish, so they moved to this new country where they could, once again, follow their own path. In the southern Low Countries, where the Spanish still held sway, Louis de Nassau marched at the head of an army, an army of Huguenot soldiers. They intended to finally, once and for all, oust the Catholic menace from the Low Countries. This was a daring move, to be sure, but it had unforeseen and unintended consequences. Two years prior, in France, the Huguenot forces had signed a treaty, a peace treaty, with their Catholic rulers called the Treaty of Saint Germain. This allowed Huguenot leaders to finally hold political office, and there was a marriage alliance promised between the French royal family and the Huguenot prince, Henry of Navarre. When, two years later, the wedding was finally to take place, it brought all of the Protestant leadership to Paris. Now, when I think about this, I see almost direct parallels to A Game of Thrones. There are characters here who are almost certainly inspirations for characters within the story. If you're a fan of either the books or the show, I'd like you to imagine that there was a marriage alliance between King Rob in the north and, say, Princess Marcella Baratheon in the south, and 
when the marriage was to take place, all of the leaders of the rebellion in the north marched down to King's Landing to be there at the wedding ceremony. What do you imagine that Queen Cersei would do in that situation with all of her enemies in her grasp? Well, it was probably very similar to what Catherine de' Medici did in France. In the days before this wedding, Paris was an uncomfortable place for people both Catholic and Protestant. Arguments and fights broke out all over the city and mobs were raised, but the peace held. On August 18th, 1572, the marriage finally took place and Paris was able to breathe a sigh of relief. But a mere four days later, a man named Admiral de Coligny, who was the most powerful man in the Huguenot forces, well, he was shot on his way home. Coligny was a staunch Protestant, he was an anti-monarchist, and he was a personal friend of John Calvin. He established Huguenot colonies in both Brazil and Florida, that Florida colony being the one that Englishmen visited in one of our previous episodes, where they allied themselves with Huguenot pirates. And this man, this great thinker and leader, now lay critically wounded by a French bullet in his bed in Paris. Now, who actually ordered this assassination attempt is unclear. It's possible that it was Catherine de' Medici, the mother of the French king. She worried that Coligny, who was very close to her son the king, would convince him to invade the Netherlands and drag France into another war. So, after the marriage alliance was consummated, well, she had Coligny in her grasp. Although it may also have been the Duke of Alba that ordered the assassination. Coligny was the man who was behind that Huguenot army, marching behind Louis de Nassau, who was currently besieging the Duke of Nassau. After the assassination attempt, while Coligny lay critically wounded, the king went to visit him personally. And that same day, while Catherine de' Medici was at dinner, a group of Protestant leaders burst in on her and demanded justice. She promised them they would have it. Again, if Catherine de' Medici were Queen Cersei, then I think Coligny would best be described as the High Sparrow. He was the leader of a group of religious zealots who were reformers that had their eyes on the throne. They were gaining influence through Coligny's close friendship with Catherine's son, the young and impressionable king. The next day, after that mob broke in on Catherine of Medici at dinner, a group of royal officials entered the home of Admiral de Coligny, murdered all of his guards as well as the noblemen that accompanied him, and finally threw Coligny from the window, killing him. The gates of Paris were closed and locked. The Swiss guard, the king's personal soldiers, armed with a list of Protestant leaders in the city, as well as their swords, marched out of the castle. The bells of the Church of St. Germain began to chime. Protestants came out of their homes to see why the bells of St. Germain were ringing at this odd hour. What they saw was a force of heavily armed Frenchmen waiting for them. The streets had been blockaded and chained. There was nowhere to run. The Protestant leaders were dispatched, shot, and beheaded. Their blood ran in the streets, their bodies were thrown in the river or paraded through the streets. The head of the Huguenot forces in France had been severed. But the mob smelled blood. Catholic loyalists rose in huge numbers, and for three days they murdered any Protestant in the city. When order was finally restored, nearly every Huguenot or Huguenot sympathizer in the city was dead. The massacre spread all throughout France, and thousands were killed. In cities all across the realm, men were run through. Women were raped and murdered. Babes were torn from their mother's arms and dashed against the pavement. The highest death toll is estimated to be at 70,000. It was said that the bells of St. Germain were heard around the world. They heard them in England. Queen Elizabeth's ambassador to France escaped barely with his life and gave Queen Elizabeth this tragic news. Tsar Ivan the Terrible of Russia wrote of it denouncing this heinous crime. Suleiman the Magnificent decried the villains that perpetrated it. And Catherine de' Medici? She marched through the streets in triumph. I imagine that the Duke of Alba and King Philip II smiled when they heard the news. I wonder if Francis Drake, on board his ship in the Caribbean halfway around the world, heard the bells of St. Germain. 
It's possible that he was meeting with his Huguenot allies in the abandoned and doomed French colony in Florida. The Protestant cause was wounded. It was a dire blow to be sure, but now they had something to rally around. This was something that proved that there could not be peace through negotiation. Now, open war was upon them. Next week, we're going to turn our eyes to that war. We're going to look at the alliances and treaties, the declaration of hostilities, and turn back to Francis Drake. We'll look at his singeing of the King of Spain's beard and the Spanish Armada. If you're enjoying the show, why not check out our website at piratehistorypodcast.com. Over there, you can find some supplemental information, such as maps and works of art relating to our topics. We also have, on every episode, a list of the sources used. If you're interested in learning more about any of the topics that we cover, those source lists also have links that go to the abebooks.com page for that book, where you can pick up a copy of anything you'd like to read more about. If you do use that service, abebooks is kind enough to throw me a couple of bucks. We also have an abebooks search bar at the website. If you'd like to support the show, there are several ways you can do so at the website. There's a PayPal donate button, as well as a link to our Patreon page. That's going to patreon.com slash piratehistorypodcast. There's also an ABooks and Amazon search bar, so if you need to search for anything on either ABooks or Amazon.com, if you do so through the website, they're kind enough to throw me a couple of bucks. In addition to any of that, you can also leave a review on either iTunes, Stitcher, or Podbean, all of which we have links for at the website. Doing this really helps get the podcast noticed, and we really appreciate it. Once again, and most importantly, thank you for listening.